This is Whole Backstage Live, and you're listening to our 13 Days of Halloween. Taken from Catherine Tucker Wyndham's 13 Alabama Ghosts and Jeffrey. This first compilation of Alabama ghost stories brings you famous ghosts and locations from throughout the mid to late 1800s. Shadows of the unrest which plagued the South during the Civil War. You can still visit some of these locations even to this day. Others have long since been reclaimed by the earth and trees and creeping vines. Thirteen individual readers will share with you these stories of love lost, unbearable tragedy, unsettled ghostly apparitions, and untimely death. Look for a new episode daily until October 31st. An angry mob seeks their idea of justice after a courthouse burns in The Face in the Courthouse Window. Since 1878, there has been the picture of a man's face so indelibly stamped on a window of the Pickens County Courthouse that it looks as if a photographer had snapped his lens and made the likeness on the glass pane. But it was no human photographer who reproduced that countenance, which reflects the anguish and terror filling the heart of a man who knew that he was face to face with violent death. The courthouse in Carrollton was burned to the ground on Thursday morning, November 16, 1876, fire broke out in several places at the same time, and for this reason the blaze was held unquestionably to be the work of an incendiary. The burning of the courthouse unleashed an emotional torrent that swept away both patience and reason. The courthouse was more to the residents than just a seat of county government. It was a symbol of their defiance of Yankee authority, sturdy evidence of their determination to overcome defeat. The original courthouse had been burned by Yankee troops under the command of General John T. Croxton on April 5th, 1865. It was a senseless burning, serving no military purpose, and it infuriated and embittered the residents of the county. In those days following the Civil War, the task of rebuilding the courthouse seemed impossible. There was no money. Materials were scarce and expensive. Skilled labor was difficult to find. Yet somehow the courthouse was rebuilt. Even the occupying federal troops who were camped in Carrollton during the post-war years must have been impressed by the achievement. To the citizens whose work and sacrifice had rebuilt the courthouse, the building represented a restoration of law and order. It was important to their sense of stability as well as to their pride. Then, less than 12 years after their first courthouse was burned by the Yankees, the residents of Carrollton watched helplessly as their second courthouse, the one they had struggled so hard to rebuild, was consumed by fire. It was almost more than they could bear. As time went on and nobody was able to point the finger of justice at any suspect, the citizens of Carrollton became uneasy and began to criticize the officers of the law for not finding the criminal. They demanded that the sheriff produce the person who had burned the courthouse so that they could sleep easy in their beds at night without waking frequently to see if they smelled something burning. The sheriff realized he must find a suspect if he possibly could. Henry Wells, a Negro who lived near the town, had a bad name. His temper was high and he had been involved in several fights. It was rumored that he always carried a razor. Nobody really saw him set fire to the courthouse, but he had been in town early on the morning when the fire occurred, and rumors connecting him with the burning began to be circulated, especially when no other suspect could be located. In spite of the fact there was only vague circumstantial evidence against him, Wells was arrested on four counts. Arson, burglary, carrying a concealed weapon, and assault with intent to murder. Wells swore that he was not guilty and was being wrongly accused, 
but in a group of men gathered about the square on the sultry afternoon of his arrest, feeling against him ran high, and with the aid of some corn whiskey it ran higher until it reached a dangerous pitch. The air on that afternoon was oppressively humid. In a ragged black cloud west of the town, the rumbling of thunder lent an additional menace to the already ominous situation. Men began milling about, demanding immediate action against Wells. Soon someone produced a rope, and hasty plans for hanging him at once were made. In an effort to save him from the excited crowd, the sheriff hid Wells in the garret of the new courthouse, but his whereabouts were soon discovered, and bent on vengeance, the angry horde closed in on the courthouse, ready to break down its doors, if necessary, to reach their prey. Wells knew why they were there, but he went to the garret window, his face gray with fear, and confronted them. Defiantly shouting at the top of his lungs, I am innocent. If you kill me, I am going to haunt you for the rest of your lives. And as later events proved, he did. Just as the bloodthirsty crowd was about to get into the building, a bolt of lightning illuminated Wells' tortured face behind the window pane. The hot, close atmosphere of the afternoon had been the prelude to a short but severe thunderstorm. And Henry Wells' picture, caught by the lightning, they say, has remained imprinted on the garret window of the Carrollton Courthouse from that day to this. Accounts vary as to how Wells actually met his death. As one story has it, the lightning killed him. Then, sobered by the event, the crowd dispersed. Satisfied that the Almighty had meted out just punishment to a criminal. Another version of the tale is that the lightning flash alarmed the mob, but not enough to stop them from hanging their victim. At any rate, everyone agrees that this was the last night of Henry Wells' life. The next morning, a calm day after the tumultuous night, a member of the lynching party was passing by the courthouse. He glanced up at the window where he had seen Wells looking out the night before, and he turned pale with fright. He rubbed his eyes, and silently cursing the corn whiskey he had drunk the night before, he looked again. And again he saw the face of Henry Wells peering down at him. He knew that Wells was dead, and he began to scream that the devil had come to haunt him. His screams brought other people to the scene, and they too saw the face of Henry Wells, distorted by fear, but an unmistakable likeness looking down at them. The face was still there the next day, and the next, and the next. Hundreds of people came to gaze in awe and disbelief at the eerie likeness. The sheriff was particularly upset by the accusing face. He was often seen carrying buckets of water up the steep stairs to try and wash away the symbol of a town's guilt. But he only succeeded in making the picture more clearly defined. No amount of scrubbing, not even with gasoline, would remove the image from the window pane. It is still there, plainly visible on the lower right-hand pane of the garret window. On at least one occasion, some people say too, every window pane in the Carrollton Courthouse was broken during a severe hailstorm, except the pane with the image of Henry Wells on it. And on stormy nights, some people swear they can hear Wells' wails coming from the twisted mouth of the face in the window. You have been listening to Holbeck Stage Live and our 13 Days of Halloween. This story was voiced by Thomas Breland. Tune in tomorrow for another Alabama Ghost Story. This has been a production of the Holback Stage Inc. and Holback Stage Live on WBSL Radio. Please, please, please take the time to visit our website and check the show description for a link to all of our social media. 
Follow us for upcoming events and announcements about what you can look forward to on our production calendar. Contact this show at holbackstagelive at gmail.com for sponsorship opportunities. Imagine your name reaching all of our listeners through our episodes. I know, crazy, right? Thank you for listening. Keep coming back and stay kind.